Shabbat Shalom. This working? Shalom. Well, it was interesting. It's uh, it's always a kind of irritating when you're expecting technology to work. It doesn't. And it reminds you how much we depend on technology. I mean, it's, it irritates me, but it's an absolute essential part of life. And uh, I, I laugh, too, because somebody said when they saw everybody up here at working, trying to get the uh, screen to work, somebody take a picture. And it, it reminds me of, we've always taken pictures, but now we all have the ability to take pictures at any minute. And share them around, it's, it, and it's, it's actually good. It, it can be misused, but it's a good thing. We're gonna look, talk a little bit about uh, the Passover today, because we've, you know, it, it's one of the things that separates uh, Christian observance and what I would call Messianic and Jewish, and that's how we determine the date of Easter, because the resurrection in most churches was a week ago tomorrow, Sunday. If you go by the biblical calendar, it's still got till, what is it, April 27th or whatever. But, you know, I, what am I doing that I'm ringing? You might, is, do I need to put it higher, Sharon? Or? Usually when you're ringing, it's too low, so is that better? Keep talking? That's not difficult. <laughs> but, and we talked about this last week in Baker, because of course they met on Easter. But as important as it is, in fact the Bible tells us to celebrate Easter, tells us to celebrate the resurrection. Uh, celebrations are only as effective as our understanding of why we're doing it. And you think about it, and it happens. Something can become tradition, and you do it every year until you don't know why you're doing it. You look at July 4th. If you ask the average American, why do we celebrate July 4th? Most people would know, but as you get further and further from the historical event that occasions the celebration, if you don't have a formal way of celebrating or remembering, you forget. And I don't remember which one of the founding fathers said it, because I've heard it attributed to several of them, but one of them said, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. And that's kind of fancy language, but he's saying, you've got to remember, you have to work at it. And so when we look at Passover and Easter, the resurrection, one of the things I think is important is to go down and look at what's it about. You know, what the kids did at those camps, it's really great that they go down there. In fact, it's absolutely essential. And one of the things you find, it's kids need to be with adults and kids need to be with kids. If they're always with adults, there are things they won't say. There are things they won't really deal with. But if they're always with kids, have you ever noticed that kids are the cruelest species on the planet? I was a kid once, it was in the Pleistocene age, but uh, you haven't taken geology yet, have you? But, and I remember that the children can be very hard on each other, on the same, but on the same length, wavelength. There are things that children need to be with other kids. They, they need to be with someone their own age. And to be able to talk about the Lord is really essential. And, and one of the problems that, we have in our culture today is that it's almost not allowed to talk about God. God is, it belongs in your home, but we don't want God in the public place. Not in the school, not in the government, not at work. No, he needs to stay home. The problem when God stays home, all the good things that God brings to a culture stay home. And eventually it leaves the home. And so when we talk about Passover, I would like you all, if you've got your Bible, and if you don't, I will turn to it. 
Most people are aware of this scripture, and if they aren't, they should be. It's 1 Corinthians 5. And in this passage, Paul is talking to the Corinthians about dealing with sin in their camp. How many of you know that's one of the hardest things we do as Christians? It's not easy as a parent with your kids. It, any place you have to deal with misbehavior, it, it's difficult. And that's what Paul's doing here. He, somebody in the congregation is doing something that's so abhorrent to Paul, he says, kick him out. <laughs> he says, what, what are you doing approving this behavior? He says, kick him out and you know, hopefully you can straighten the situation out. In verse, dealing with these little words, these little numbers again. Verse 6, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? What kind of language is Paul using here? Passover language. Why is that Passover language? What do we eat during Passover? Unleavened bread. Unleavened bread. And so Paul is saying, clean out the leaven. Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are. And, and we would say, how do we describe a big batch of dough? Do we call it a lump? A lump seems like the wrong word to me, but, but that's what he's talking about. You've, you've seen people make bread, and they get a big uh, bowl, something full of dough, and that's what he says. You're a new lump. Says, and then he says, in this translation, for Christ, for the Messiah, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now, translators add words to make it clearer. The text does not have lamb here. The text says, Christ or the Messiah, our Passover. It doesn't say our Passover lamb. Why? Because the Passover is the lamb. And I think most Christians are aware of this, but you should know that one of the pictures of who Jesus, Yeshua is, is the Passover. And the Passover is a very different sacrifice. When these kids go to camp and they learn about Yeshua, about Jesus, and loving him and having a relationship with him, it's all built on him being the Passover. One of the interesting things when you look at Exodus 12, and I'm going to turn there, and it's talking about the Passover. There are a lot of sacrifices that God called the people to do. The Passover is really different. Why is it different? And I turn to Leviticus, not Exodus. They're close, but they're not the same. What do you typically do with an offering? You burn it. You sacrifice it, skin it, cut it up, and depending on what sacrifice it is, some of it's all burned on the altar, some of it's burned on the altar and shared with the priest and the person offering it. Some like the sin offering, the whole thing's taken outside the camp if it's a sin offering for the priest or the whole congregation. But with Passover, what do you do with the offering? Somebody said, you eat it. If you read through Exodus 12, and I'll read just a few verses here, it will strike you that the Passover is so different because this offering is to be eaten. And we just read in 1 Corinthians 5, who is our Passover? Christ, Jesus, Yeshua. He is our Passover. And so you come to Exodus 12. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. When is it? It's in the spring. And, and the difference between the, the dating for Easter and Passover is over the fight of how you set the date. Uh, the Jewish calendar is a lunar calendar. It's based on the month start 
with the dark of the with the sliver of the moon, and it goes till the moon wanes, then comes back. Well, the solar calendar that we have is based on the sun, and I think everyone here knows that the moon, the, the lunar cycles don't coincide with the sun. The sun, we we make a full revolution around the sun every year. And a year is pretty close to 365 days. How many of you know it's not exactly 365 days? What's happening this, what just happened this year? We, we, we put an extra day in there every four years, and that's still not right. But it's close. And I don't remember the rest. I think every couple hundred years or something, you take a day out. And we're, what we're trying to do is stick with the year. Why? If you didn't it, you'd be like the Muslims with Ramadan. And the Muslims stick strictly to a lunar calendar. So Ramadan occurs every 12 lunar months. It ends up happening in every month of the year according to our calendar because it's not based on the sun. The solar calendar allows you to stick to the same season. The way the Jews handle this with the biblical calendar is they have a leap month. And this leap month is seven years out of 19. How's that for making you scratch your head? But if you didn't do this, then Passover would do the same thing. And, and the Bible is very clear that Passover happens in the spring. And that's one place that the Christians and the Jews agree, it happens in the spring. When the Council of Nicaea got together and said, we don't, this was a time when the church hated the Jews. Some of that still isn't gone, but it's a little better now. And they said, we're not going to date the resurrection on that Jewish calendar. We're going to make it our own. And so they decided that Easter would be the first Sunday after the first full moon after the equinox. And that's why Easter was last Sunday. But with the Jewish calendar, it's the 14th day of the first month, which wanders a bit. You know what's important in all this? It's probably all important, but what's vital is that Passover, what happens at Passover is the first month. In Greek, the word for first is protos. And if you go look at anything where Jesus says, this is protos, he means it's the first, it's the most important, it's the dominating influence. When they ask him, what's the first commandment? That was the word. And so here, God tells Moses, that the first month is now. It's in the spring. How we ended up with the first month in January is kind of hilarious, really. But there is some rhyme to it. What happens just before January 1st? <coughs> the days start to get longer. And you know, for us cultures that live in the winter, that's time for a celebration. <laughs> the sun's coming back. We're not going to be destroyed in darkness. But in the Bible, the first month is this one. It's in the spring. It shall be the beginning of the months. It shall be the first month of the year. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat. You shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. And I think everyone here knows that in the Gospels, when it describes Yeshua, Jesus, getting ready for crucifixion, that he's crucified at Passover. And Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, every one of the Gospels, work very hard for you to know that it, it, it never says he's the Passover. It just wants you to know that that's what's happening. The first one to actually say he is our Passover is Paul. They all agreed and they all saw that. Now there's something that I want to take a little bit of time with because it, it deals with what the kids do at this camp and one of the things that we look to do as we gather for Passover. talks about, you'll take some of the, oh yeah, let's, verse 7, 
they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. So again, this sacrifice is to be eaten. But the blood from the sacrifice, what typically was done with the blood of a sacrifice? It was poured against the altar. But this sacrifice was to be taken and put on the lintel of the houses and the doorposts. And if you go down, got to go clear down to verse 21. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover. And again, my translation here says the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of the house until the morning. Now, I think everybody here, all of us as Christians, know of the importance of the blood of the Savior, the blood of Yeshua, the blood of Jesus. What, is, what, is this, what does this picture mean to you? What does it mean to me? How are you going to apply the blood to the doorpost of your house and the lintel, or is this something that is irrelevant to us? Take your scripture and go to Revelation 12. You see, I believe that when they have these camps, they're teaching the kids how to put the blood on the doorpost of their house and on the lintel. So you need, you, this is important. We're coming up to Passover. What, what does it mean? Now, in Revelation 12, it's talking about the war in heaven between Michael and Satan. And frankly, none of us totally understand this. A lot of people think this totally fulfilled, some think none of it's fulfilled, some think it's somewhere in the middle, which is probably true. But in any case, it's talking about, verse 7, a war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. The dragon fought back, but he was defeated. But now it comes to this very important statement, verse 10. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. Who is the accuser of the brothers? I heard Lois say it. Satan. Satan. What does the word Satan mean? The word comes from the word what? Set. Like set, Satan. Satan. Set, set, oh, it, it, yeah. It's, which is the Egyptian god, uh, god that, you know, the sun sets. It's the dark. Anyway, we won't know this. It's complicated. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate the answer. It, Satan, it does have to do with adversary or accuser. And that's interesting what you said, Kai, about goes back to the Egyptian god Set. Uh, because what's one of the things that the blood of the Passover lamb did? It destroyed all the gods of Egypt. If you read Exodus 12, it says that. Now, you tell me, because you, I'll bet you know this passage I'm reading. It says that Michael and his host defeated Satan. And that says, now have come the power and the salvation of our Messiah, our Christ. It goes on to tell me how they did it. Who can tell me how they did it? How did they defeat the accuser of the brethren? How many of you know the accuser of the brethren is still a problem? Has anybody here ever been the victim of people talking about you? Or you have been the person doing the talking? Whose side are you on when you're doing that? There's an accuser of the brethren, and there's a Passover lamb. The Passover lamb is not the accuser. We sometimes do Satan's work. But now, can, come on, somebody. Okay, and they overcame him. By the blood of the 
by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, the word of their testimony and they love not their lives to the death. That doesn't sound kind of esoteric. I mean, we get these kids together and say, we, we believe in Yeshua, we believe in Jesus, he died for our sins. I want to be born again. I, I want to come into this new life. Well, how, do, what, how does the blood of the Lamb help that? What does it mean? If I got the high school kids together, or how many, 11 kids from here going down to this camp, I would love to do this, to sit them down and say, what is the blood of the Lamb? What does that do for you? I mean, it's how Michael and his hosts overcame the accuser. It was through the blood of the Lamb and the word of their witness. What is the hyssop that you apply the blood to the doorpost? You know, it's interesting, the Jews, I have somewhere, I have this written down, I think. In Jewish tradition, the cedar tree is the great, lofty, the valued tree. But the hyssop represents modesty and humility. And, you know, you think about this, this is pretty important. If the blood of the lamb is how you destroy the adversary, then how do you put that on your house? What does that mean? And is it connected, the blood of the Lamb, is it connected to the word of your testimony? Greg, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I, I think <coughs> what you're saying is really important. And I think as we're looking at the students going down to that camp, uh, Hebrews talks about this type of thing. And I think it's really telling. And it's been a while since I've read this scripture, but it is a good, great scripture as far as dealing with sacrifice is concerned. It says, therefore, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. And I think as you're talking about this thing, that's exactly what happens when we profess his name. In effect, we are taking his blood, thanking him for what he's done and putting it on our doorpost. And not only that, but we're sharing it. We're, take, we're taking it out and telling of the good things that God has done. Exactly. I'm not saying it's the whole thing, but a huge amount, a, a very pertinent thing here in putting the blood on the doorpost is your testimony. It's standing up and saying, I know that the Father sent his Son, that he laid his life down on the tree, he shed his blood, and by his blood I am saved. Those words are how we actually put the blood on our house. And, you know, I, I don't know about the rest of you, but we'll have testimony meeting once a month, and, and testimony meeting is really important to, to thank the Lord and, and to praise him. <laughs> But I, I've noticed how a lot of times people will say, well, I haven't got anything to say. Is there anything more life-changing than that the Passover lamb laid his life down? See, and, and it, one of the problems we have is something that happens all the time becomes kind of commonplace. And, and, that, that's the way it is. It's one of the reasons that we have celebrations, to remind us, to keep it in mind. But it, we have all these scriptures. I wrote, I wrote a few of them down. Do you remember what David says about hyssop in Psalm 51? here remembers the historical context of Psalm 51. David is crying out to the Lord for forgiveness here, right? What's, what happened? What's the history? It's his sin with Bathsheba. And, and it's, it's very significant to me. David is a man after God's own heart. He commits this horrific sin 
and he's not really worried about it until God sends the prophet Nathan to him and tells him a story about a rich man who had huge flocks of sheep and a poor man who had one lamb who sleeps with him, a lamb that this man dearly loves. And the rich man has a friend come to visit him, and the rich man goes and takes the poor man's lamb and kills it to feed his friend. Do you remember what David's reaction was to this story? He was so angry he was going to kill the person that did it. And what does Nathan say to him? You're the man. You, you are the man. Or in the King James, thou art the man. It sounds a little holier. <laughs> but, but at this point, see, the sin didn't bother until he grappled with it. You realize when we have our kids go to camp, a lot of times what we're, we're praying will happen is that they'll face their sin. I remember, like I told you I think a week ago or so, when Jerry Owen came out here and he'd get up and preach and he'd talk about repent. Repent and believe. He says, everybody needs to repent. And I think, well, why? I'm pretty good. I'm not so bad. <laughs> Shouldn't be laughing. <laughs> I don't know if any of you had the same experience. <laughs> but he'd get up and he'd talk and he'd talk. And I remember one day he just hit with this conviction. I am a sinner. Left to my own devices, I'll go to death. I'll destroy myself. Well, what did David do left to his own devices? It's horrible what he did. And I remember one time I got up and I said to one of these, a class just like this, I said, you know what, I finally realized that put in the same circumstances, I have no assurance I wouldn't do what David did. And several of the older women said, oh no, you never would. I remember thinking, you don't know human nature. See, we judge David because what he did is abominable. But we don't have that kind of power. I, I can't just go tell somebody to show up at my house and they're, you know, I, I just don't. The temptations that David faced, I, I have no concept. So I can't judge him. I really can't. His actions judged him. And when he's confronted with his sin, it's interesting, he has injured his family, his kingdom, he's killed Uriah, he's dishonored Bathsheba, all these things. And he says, against you, you only have I sinned. Because he realizes this all started because he lost his connection with his father. It isn't that those other sins aren't real and there. But, and, and this brought great judgment on David's life. But in this is the context of Psalm 51. And David, you know, he says in verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. In sin my mother conceived me. Then he says, Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. There's something about hyssop that's a cleansing agent. Do you remember in the, what's the word here? The cleansing of a leper, you use hyssop. And in the burning of the ashes of the red heifer, you use hyssop. So you see hyssop being used as kind of a cleansing agent, but certainly an applying agent. When you look through your scripture, and I think everybody, everybody would know this. How are we redeemed? We're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. First, first Peter 117, that's what it says. We have been redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb. He says, it's not silver or gold. It's the blood of the Lamb that's redeemed us. And then Ephesians 1 says the same thing. Greg mentioned Hebrews. In Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews is talking about how the first covenant was put into effect by the sprinkling of blood. I think you all remember that. But then he says, according to the law, according to the Torah, one may almost say, all things are cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no, and I mean, everybody knows, what? There is no forgiveness. Does that make sense to your mind? It, it doesn't right off the bat, and yet we all understand that if there is a creator, then anything that goes against his nature 
is going to have to somehow be fixed, paid for. And there's a, there's a story in Ezekiel 9. It's kind of a sobering picture. But the angel comes to Ezekiel and says, here's this writing kit. I want you to go through Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations which are being committed in its midst. But he said, but to the others, he said, my hearing, go through the city after him and strike. Do not let your eye have pity and do not spare. It's kind of an awful story of judgment. But what it says is those who are marked will be spared. What happened at Passover? Do you realize the Egyptians that were starting to fear the Lord and participated in the Passover and put the blood on their house were not affected by the angel of death. It passed over them. So we, we have all these pictures. I'm going to take just a minute and listen to some things that Yeshua said, Jesus. And I think in our context, some of the things Jesus said don't offend us because we have all these years to think about it. In Acts 15, where they said the Gentiles were coming to faith, do you remember the four things they said they had to do before they even walked in the door? Don't eat yeah, don't eat things sacrificed to idols. No sexual immorality. I think it's porneia in the Greek. Don't eat things strangled. And don't eat blood. blood. John said it. Why? Now, in that context, does this make sense to you? Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Then the Jews began to argue with one another, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Yeah, that's, you know. So, Yeshua, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. Does that make sense with what I just said about Acts 15? He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink, and he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he will also live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died, he who eats this bread will live forever. So then many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This statement is very unpleasant. <laughs> Who can listen to it? How many of you know that that's probably a sanitized word in English? I don't think they said this was unpleasant. I think they said it was revolting. But Yeshua, Jesus, aware that his disciples were cleaning, complaining about it, said to them, Is this offensive to you? What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh provides no benefit. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. There's a tension in Scripture, isn't there? They told the early believers, the Gentiles that didn't know anything of the Torah, they didn't know the prohibitions against lying, coveting, all that stuff. You know, they didn't tell them, you can't lie and covet. Because they figured they'd learn that. They said, you can't walk in the door until you have renounced the eating of blood. And yet, if I don't drink his blood, I have no life in me. It's important to figure this out. Or to come to this conclusion, 
I don't understand it. Let's think of something. Remember we said the sacrifices are offered by fire. How is the Passover offered? It's eaten. Is there any relationship between what goes on in your body and fire? Absolutely. Cellular respiration is a type of combustion. The result of both is uh, carbon dioxide and water. Now, are they identical? Not exactly, but what happens when you eat something? You break it down into components. It's either assimilated into the body or it's broken into components that you can use to produce energy. In the case of your body, ATP. Any of you biology students remember what ATP is? They're all looking down. <laughs> Sharon's going, you better know the answer. It's a facilitator for enzymes. A facilitator for enzymes. I'm sure that's helping. Level. But it is. Yes, it is. That's exactly but, but anyway, what we get out of this, when we eat something, we're able to get energy from it, and we're able to build our bodies. This is why it's so important what we eat. You know the old thing, you are what you eat? Well, it's kind of true. In fact, is there any element in you that you didn't take in by eating? That's how you get it. The big three, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. You need them all. When you burn something, you also transform it. And how many of you know that it says in Numbers 28, the Lord's talking about the offerings, and he says, these are my food. In Hebrew, it says lechem, bread. You know, bet lechem, house of bread. He says, and they're like, how is this your food? In some way, God gains from the sacrifice. I think that if we adequately could understand what the elements in communion represented, we'd be much more eager to take it every week. And the interesting thing about it is that the act of taking it is probably not what changes us. It's the belief in what happens. Because when you take the flesh and blood, it is an act of obedience, but it's a prophetic act. Do you understand what I'm saying? That when you take the flesh and blood, and, and see, the, Christ, the church has fought over this because the Catholics took that literal, literally, that when you eat, the wafer and drink the wine, you're literally taking in the, the flesh and blood of the Messiah. This is a doctrine called transubstantiation. I think I mentioned this to you before. When you go to a Catholic church, what's the center? What, what is the focus of the whole meeting? It's the ark, whatever you want to call it, that has the elements. Because that's the presence of the Lord. And so when you come into it, in taking his flesh and blood, you come into his presence. I think there's a lot of good things in that. Because you look at our, organ, our church and most churches, the center of attention is the pulpit. It's the preacher. And the Reformation did this intentionally. Because they didn't like transubstantiation, and I've got some issues with it too. But the concept that we're taking in his body and taking in his spirit, which is in the bread and the wine, is entirely foundational to our belief because Jesus is saying, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. There's something that happens. So when we tell people you need to believe you need to come to the Lord. And you do. Belief. We put the blood on our house and really what happens when you put the blood on your house is you leave it. You leave Egypt. And any time that we quote put the blood on something, we're asking to make a separation and leave it. Blood on disease, whatever it might be. We pray the blood, and, and when you look at the passage that I mentioned, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives to the death. It indicates 
that there's a strength in properly using the blood of the Lamb. And yet, I don't know, it's easier to talk about it in an ethereal, symbolic way and not, how does that apply to my everyday life? We, we mentioned that we sin against each other. We hurt each other. How, how does the blood help us? If you find yourself participating with the accuser of the brethren, if you find yourself, one of the saddest things about human beings, in fact, I'll go to Galatians 5. There's an aspect of human behavior where we are cannibals. Is that a comfortable truth like the other one? You find this offensive? Listen to what Paul says. This is 5.13. You were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. So how is Paul saying here that we're consuming each other's flesh? By our words, right? Yes, it is biting it, but by our words. So it's by my words, or his words, that I take in the lamb. And, you know, we, we were touching on this just the other day, and... I think everybody here has watched a cow chew its cud. Anybody here not seen a cow chew its cud? When we walk through a pen of cows, we see a cow lying down chewing her cud, what do we assume? Yeah, she's, she's relaxed and she's doing well. Greg was saying, and I, I should know these numbers, but I think it sounds right to me that a cow probably spends about a third of her life chewing her cud. Why do, why do they do that? That's how they get every last bit of nutrition out of it. Now, it's kind of revolting to think of bringing it back up and having another go. But it, <laughs> but it works for cows. But when you, when you look at the scripture and it talks about meditating on the word, did you realize sometimes the words it uses are words very similar to ruminating? Would it make, when it talks about eating, when Yeshua, Jesus talks about eating the flesh and blood, would it make sense to say that part of what we would do is take the word, read it, think about it, and then bring it back and think about it again. Because here's the thing that's very important. We all know that as Christians, as Messianics, we aren't perfect. But we also know scripturally that if we have been born again, we're being conformed to his image. We're being changed into his likeness. How does that happen? It happens by this process of taking in the word and processing it over and over and over. And one of the things that I notice when you, you come to biblical truth, or really any truth, but biblical truth particularly, is sometimes when people start to examine it through the eye of an observer, it becomes less and less real to them. If you read the Word of God in a sense to say, can this really be true? If you read this to be a cynic, it isn't going to do you much good. I, I was reading on the uh, Passover by a, a renowned New Testament scholar. His name is James Tabor, Tabor, however you want to say his name. And he was a conservative Christian believer at one point. But as he studied and studied and studied and studied, he's lost his faith. And so I, I, 
it was interesting because he has a lot of fascinating details to add. But as I was reading what he said, I realized what he had done was when he decided what could be and what couldn't. And then he read the text that way. If you read about the Lord and say, well, that can't be, you're going to find yourself building a gospel that's for you and about you. And you will be on the throne. And, and reading him, he was saying, well, he knows, like this passage in John 6, my, my flesh is true bread and the wine is true drink. He says, that was added after Yeshua had died. Because no self-respecting Jew would say that. I thought, but he did say it. And, and it was amazing, this brilliant guy, and then he, he approached the resurrection the same way. You, you know, where, as they're getting ready to, uh, to eat the Passover, and again, eat, 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 eat. That's what it says about the Passover. You eat it. You don't look at it. You don't talk about it. To celebrate it, you eat it. But remember where Yeshua says, uh, I'm not going to drink of the fruit of the vine until I come back in my kingdom. Well, James Tabor has decided that what he meant, he believed that when he and his apostles stood for the truth, that then God would come down and back them up and overthrow Rome. Can you imagine anything further from the truth? But he had decided what could be and what couldn't. And of course, he's done the same thing with the resurrection. Even though Yeshua says over and over and over, I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to die. And then I'm going to be raised on the third day. James Tabor is saying, oh no, he, the res the resurrection couldn't happen. I've been reading this book, and it's not fascinating because it's way over my head, but it's talking about the left and the right hemisphere of your brain and how important you are it, it is to have both of them. And on most tests, if you check it out, you know, I find myself very left-brained. He shows the huge downside for society when society becomes left-brained. It's all about facts. It's all about snapshots of reality. Where the right brain will look at something, and it, the right brain can ignore little details that interfere with the main story. And if the right brain does not supersede the left brain, people are super susceptible to be deceived. And I've never seen this before. Because if, all, if you break life down into a bunch of intricate little facts, See, like the resurrection. Has the resurrection ever happened before? Before the time of Yeshua? People would come back from the dead, but you know, it, it's, a, it's a new thing, so it can't happen. The problem is, everybody who witnessed it. If you read 1 Corinthians 15, probably a thousand people witnessed Jesus, Yeshua, after his crucifixion. The left brain will say, people are not resurrected. And it will completely ignore this big picture that says, uh, how come there are a thousand people out there saying that they saw him after he died? And it's, it's really shown me, and of course, one of the things, if you've studied anything about the brain at all, there's a connection between the two halves of the brain. It's called the corpus callosum. If you've ever looked at a brain, I've looked at a lot of brains, like in... Uh, necropsies, there's this white band of tissue that connects the two hemispheres. And it's really, it's the uh, pathways between the two. In women, this pathway is much more functional. I hate to break it to you guys. In fact, the way John Sanford put it, at a certain stage in the fetus's life, there's this wash of hormones, and it uh, creates brain deficiency in males. You can't quote me on that one. You could have just gone without saying that. <laughs> but here's the funny thing. What happens 
is men, have you ever noticed, men are generally better at compartmentalizing. They generally are. And there's times that's useful. But the ability to keep the connection is generally a little better in women. And, and there are always going to be exceptions. But what I thought was interesting is that, have you noticed our society today has become extremely left-brained? What are the facts? And they list all this group of facts. And here's the truth. It needs the facts, but it needs a connection. And there are a lot of scholars and theologians that are so left-brained, they miss the truth. They're, and the other thing is that the right brain flows in life, where the left brain has a little more of a tendency to have snapshots. It's a little series of events. You need both. But his point, I don't know if I agree yet, because I'm not smart enough to agree or disagree, is that in normal life, our right brain dominates for everybody, male and female. And in a society where it loses its right brain, it becomes tremendously susceptible to deception. They can be fooled. All that to say, we need to wrap this up. What is the blood of the Lamb? It's the blood that was shed for you and me. What is the hyssop that we put in on our doorpost? It is our testimony. And as we come up to Passover, and we've just had Easter, when's the last time you told your wife or your husband that you know that the blood of Yeshua, the blood of Jesus, saved you? That you know that it speaks a word that he rose from the grave and you have hope? That it speaks a word that no matter how terrible the situation, no matter if your dreams are bones bleaching in the wilderness, that through the blood they can be resurrected. If you and I are not putting those into words, we're going to find ourselves overcome by the accuser. As we come to Passover, I would like you each to be thinking about how can I more effectively put the blood on the doorposts and on the lintel? You know, I think it's interesting when you think about where that's put. That means when a person leaves the house, what do they go through? You, you know, it's very interesting. And of course, it's the Jew that thought of this. When you look at a, a doorpost with blood on the sides and on the top, what does it look like? A birth canal. Was Israel born that day? You bet they were. What happens to us when we say, I confess that Yeshua, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is my Savior? You know, sometimes we think, oh, it's just words. Guarantee you, if you are not saying it, you're, you're forfeiting some power in your life. It's not a hammer to hit people over the head with. A lot of times, you're the one that needs to hear you saying it. And so I'm, I'm grateful that the kids get a chance to go do this. But I'm telling you, it's one of those things that you keep doing for the rest of your life. It happened, you're born, but you, as to grow up, you can't forget where you came from. And that's why the Bible says Passover is the first month it's the first event. It's the event where your life begins. And until it starts there, you really haven't started. And it isn't my job or your job to judge other people, just to share the witness to the truth. And one of the things that's great about the Passover story, and I alluded to it, is the hope in it. You know, it seems like the last week or two, I have run into more heartache, frustration, hurt than I've seen in years. And sometimes when you, you run headlong into it, like if, you know, one of the hardest things we ever deal with is being betrayed. We betray each other. We do. It actually produces death in us. There's only one source of the resurrection, and it's that blood. And it's, the Bible tells us this blood speaks a better word than the blood of Abel, which spoke of revenge. 
This blood speaks of hope, of resurrection, of new life, of new beginning. I don't think there's a better example in Ezekiel where he sees this valley of dry bones and they are so dry, so dead, that there's nothing left on them. No sinew, muscle, nothing. It's dry bones. And the Lord asks Ezekiel a wonderful question. Can these bones live? What's the answer? It's yes. Yes. And that's the hope that's in us. These bones can live. And yes, that's a picture of the whole house of Israel. It's a picture of the whole body. And it's really all comes... It, the picture of the valley of the dry bones is one of the reasons that at the time of Jesus, Yeshua, that the Jews believed in the resurrection. And see, sometimes people think of the resurrection, oh, in fact, the Gnostics believe this. He never really came back in the body. He died and became a spirit and went to heaven. The Bible teaches very clearly, no, he came back in a body. Tremendous time of hope. And in this time, you know, I pray that God would reach out and touch the hurt in people's lives, in your life, the places that die. Have you ever noticed that when dreams are consistently squashed, something actually dies? You wake up one day and you realize it's dead. Can't, it, it can't be resurrected, and, and yes, it can, because of the blood of the Lamb. And that's our hope. Let's stand. Robin, would you close for us, please? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here together and worship you as, as a group once again. We ask you to continue to be with us through this week and help and protect and put joy in our lives. We thank you for all your blessings and say this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.